Yeah, they changed the go live button. It's just... I know the UI designers feel like they're contributing, but sometimes, man, sometimes I question it. We may have some on this show. If you're a UI designer and you swap the order of the OK and cancel buttons, give me a call. We should talk. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Warren, what's going on, man? Uh, well, you know, thanks for welcoming me back. I know the last last couple of weeks uh, I've been actually out of commission, uh, traveling in, in Berlin. Uh, but I have an interesting fact for uh, today uh, on the adventures of DevOps. And that's uh, in the last three weeks, there have been two different TOTP mobile app providers who have both been popped in some way and significant vulnerabilities been discovered. Uh, one of them just straight out sold to a malicious third party. So it's a good reminder that passwords are always insecure and uh, mobile apps don't make it any more secure. I, it's really amazing, actually. I'm just going to say a revenue stream is a revenue stream is a revenue stream. <laughs> Right on. Yeah, I, I agree. I wish that more um, more providers supported YubiKeys because I, mm. I like those a lot. And I hate the ones that say, hey, we'll text you a code. I'm like, great. That's not secure at all. But thanks for making it harder to use your app. Anyway, joining us today, Marcus Thurner. Marcus, how are you, man? Good. Thanks a lot for having me. Exciting to be in a podcast. Yeah, it's going to be an excellent podcast, as I understand it. Um, And you are the director of technology at Vista, right? Yes, one of them. Um, I'm working in uh, order management. Right on. And then we're just going to completely bypass that and derail the show entirely because it says on your LinkedIn profile, you are a professional chocolate taster. Is that a real thing? Uh, that was a real thing. It's not a thing anymore. Um, it's just like, um, um, yeah, my wife had a startup for four years in that um, uh, uh, bean-to-bar chocolate making uh, business. And uh, you got to do what you got to do as a husband and, <laughs> and taste the chocolate and enjoy the ride. Um, it was a good time, but I think it's still good to keep some fun stuff on a LinkedIn profile instead of like... It starts to be too serious otherwise. Right. Oh, I agree 100%. Um, There was a time early on in LinkedIn days where you could just endorse anyone for anything. And so some of my friends endorsed me for um, professional GIF expert or something like that. Because about 90% of the time, I'll reply with a GIF or a meme instead of actual text. And so for the longest time, I was endorsed for that on LinkedIn. And then they decided to take that seriously and removed it. And now you can only get endorsed for authorized roles, but no professional chocolate taster. Yeah. Right. Like professional chocolate taster. I mean, I like the fact that it was for your wife because your vows were for better or for worse. And I mean, that's just the job. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) I wonder if there's a uh, connection though. Like, have you been able to find a way to take the, lessons learned from startup chocolate making to back to the technology world has there been any overlaps um i think i think yes i mean running a business is um actually you learn a lot more when you're a single woman or you know just a very tiny business just trying to survive um you do everything right you do everything for your customers you do everything for every cent um and I think, you know, I didn't live it personally. Um, I've worked in a tiny company before, so I did a lot of that myself. So, it, but I think that is what comes daily into a software engineer's job. I mean, you're not necessarily getting tasked of write these three functions. You're getting tasks of solving a specific problem. And then it comes in and sometimes the problem is solved by writing an email and not writing any code. Um, so, so there is this, this sense of, I want to do something good for the customer and for the business, um, or ideally the mix of both. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think it's a different drive what you have um, and what uh, type of skills that what you learn. And I think it goes back to university projects where everyone does it in some form or shape. Um, and 
you know, motivation there and just trying to be, trying to make it the best what you can at that point. But with all the naivety, what you have as, a, I don't know, 15-year-old in school or 25-year-old in university and stuff. Yeah, I think there's a tangential relationship there to freelancing as well, because I did freelancing for a number of years and I talk with a lot of people who look at the rates that freelancers charge and they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And so I try to caution everyone and say, okay, that's, that number is big, but you're not always going to bill 40 hours a week like you would. So like divide that number by three, because for every hour that you work billing a client, you have another hour of work for accounting and bookkeeping and, and all of the stuff with running your business. And then there's an additional hour on top of that where you need to do sales and marketing and prospecting and finding your next gig. So even though that hourly rate looks big, you have to divide it by three to realistically put it into scope of what your actual job is. I think you're underselling the stress that comes along with it as well, right? You're not just doing those parts of the job that you normally think about. There's every other aspect to it. And then there's getting away from it and going back, quote unquote, home and still thinking about your business because it's your livelihood and how to market in sales outside of that, even when you're not making anything for that particular customer. So I can imagine there's a lot that goes into that for a very small uh, startup, especially one in the chocolatiering space. I think it definitely also depends on, even on now in software engineering or some technology aspect is, are you more into, you know, short-term projects? Like there's just like a lot of noise and overhead and phone calls to just make, I don't know, this week, this week's gig work worth it. And others might be, oh, I'm basically just like a loner and have your project assignment. There is, you know, the economics change, but also you get a lower rate. So I think in the end, the market tries to optimize for that, but like, um, yeah, you definitely learn also back to those skill sets and this drive to, uh, I need to justify that hour, right? And I think that's the yeah. beauty of external people. They show up, they need to justify every single hour. And if external people are used the right way, independent of whether they come from a big company type of consultancy or as a one person is, they don't have the overhead of a company, right? And that's, that's I think, in important as you collaborate with those external people and making sure this hour needs to value differently than an internal one. The internal one, you train that person to be excited in five years to grow internally versus for the other one, like this is the task in a week you're gone. This is how I can, can actually get the value out of it. And also, hey, I paid you that, but you also delivered. I think that's really interesting dynamics, but often an oversight for those who are on the other hand, so not the freelancer, but actually receiving the freelance work and actually make that make that a thing and make make it work and make it valuable. For sure. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about engineering excellence because that is our our topic for the day. So, right. Marcus, give us like your your high level thoughts on what is engineering excellence and and why it's important to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it potentially builds up a little bit on where you started uh, us here on you know, just, just having the drive on figuring out what's best for the business and the customer in the end, right? And you just like, it's not fulfilling a job description, uh, but it's just uh, <laughs> whatever needs to get done. But that said, let's, let's focus more on the excellence part and the engineering part uh, and probably start with what is excellence, right? And there's probably variety of definitions when you look up on the dictionaries and like it's vague um but but some of those sentences definitely resonated with you it's something like greatness or being the very best and you know there's millions of soft engineers in the world not everyone can be the very best not everyone can be you know these star singers or star sports and athletes and so on but nevertheless um you know Look, look, look at uh, other disciplines like sports. You might not become, you know, the next world champion of whatever sports, but you can look at them, you learn from them, and you kind of strive to do better, even if you know you're never getting there. Um, you know, you might have your lap times on running, 
and then you just might want to be 10 seconds faster in half a year. And you're proud of that. You're striving for this incremental improvement. So anyway, so excellence, I think it obviously depends on where you're coming from, but generally it is about the relentless drive to become or to, to envision that greatness and embrace it and, and make iterations towards that. Um, and, and I think it's a little bit harder to find what does this mean in, in a job that's not so, you know, you don't get so many medals <laughs> by being the best. You don't get, you know, you're not this ski champion who is the fastest. You're not the golfer who uses the, the least amount of um, things. You're not now in the, you know, Copa America and the European World Champion. There's just one team winning it. But nevertheless, those who are already out of the race, they are, they are part of the excellence drive as well. So let's not forget that. So it's definitely very inclusive of, of a lot of people here. Um, and um, But nevertheless, I think all of those who are on that playing field, they, they are they're just like doing one more thing than anyone else. So anyway, so how does how does that translate a little bit into engineering? And I think one of the the interesting talks probably that, that many might know is uh, Linus Torvalds defining good taste software. Um, and he did that in a TED talk something like 10 years ago and showed like, hey, this is how computer science teaches you to remove an item off a single linked list or something like that. Um, and it had this if condition in it <laughs> he was not necessarily bothered by what is taught by computer science, but why these if conditions? It's just like there might be a bug in this thing, and there's another if condition added, and it just adds this complexity versus really trying three layers deep of what's the thing? How can you solve it? And how can you solve it in a way that is just like that's the thing what it does? There's no discussions about it. There's basically no way of an alternative pass if the first one and the last one or the middle one and so on. Like all of a sudden you get into, no, that's the thing, no matter which item in the in this list it is. Um, and I think that one is an interesting one in writing code. Um, and, and I think now these days is um, a lot of that is, a, a lot of us are working in the cloud or in some other form of you know, compute environment. And, and I think one of the, the interesting phrases one I want to put out here, and it's, well, let, let's, let's start with first one step back. I think there are, are two different things. One is kind of an agreed baseline. And you can set that in your company or for yourself, you can set that at whatever level you actually want. And hopefully that level of that baseline increases over time. Um, but I think those are, you know, you can look at classical engineering KPIs. How quick are you to recover from a failure in production? How quick are you uh, able to, you know, what's the velocity in the team? Um, what's the error rate? You know, there's the DORA metrics out there. There's a bunch of other ways to measure that. Whether you really measure that or just like gut feeling type of measurement almost doesn't matter. But like, that's the baseline security. Warren, you had a, an example at the beginning, like, you know, okay, how do we, you know, instead of increasing your password rotations, can we actually decrease the amount of passwords we have in our systems, right? It's a different type of approach, how you can think of that. Um, and that, that's, I think there is, I don't think there is a standard in the world, but there's general agreement of those are good things, right? Um, and I think then there's this other part which is not this baseline, it it's very drives innovation. It drives to try out something new. And trying out something new in your environment might be, I've never worked in the cloud, but let's run the first service in the cloud, even though that's a 10 plus year old thing. Um, it might be, oh, this is how we do things here on running a specific workflow. Let's try an alternative way. Um, you're not getting into JavaScript front-end frameworks because you try another one every other week. Um, but still, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm still curious on here. the one 10 years ago. Who is still on change? <laughs> I mean, you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful there. Cause I'm sure someone's still using like Ember or knockout or, or something like that. That's uh, that's still around. I, I mean, there, there's an interesting question here of 
of how, how do you even measure an engineer to be better and whether or not the excellence happens at an individual level or at, at a team level? You know, I know that I'm a terrible individual software engineer and I shudder to think that someone will be evaluating me on like the number of lines of code that I, I turn out because I, I know that number is incredibly small. Yeah, and even if that's the right metric. So I think that's one of the things that I think about when I think about engineering excellence is defining how we're going to define excellent because i think it varies from team to team you know each team is going to consider different things important and you can't have everything important so i think everyone just has to have that conversation you know to say these are the things that we're going to consider important and you know maybe that's going to change over time but this is where we're going to start and everyone's on the same page there there is this underlying assumption, though, that it's somehow not directly related to the business, right? Because, you know, otherwise you would say somehow engineering excellence means delivering the right business outcome. Or, I mean, maybe there's some business metrics already. You know, why not use that term? So, I don't know. At least for me, it, it does sort of spark this idea of what are we innovating? What are we, what are we improving in some way? What, what is that, really? You know, what is the meaningful outcome? And I think the Linus Torvalds... Uh, uh, coding good taste is, is, an, is an interesting aspect here because how you write that function, how does it impact the business? Does it? I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So what are we even evaluating there and how do we even do that? Absolutely. And I think, you know, going to the individual versus team, in the end, it counts what the team delivers, right? Uh, it's the same when you have a team sports, um, you can have the star players and no, uh, one star player often can have a pretty bad team because everyone caters around that star player um, and, and typically doesn't have much of a chance against a team that's just very cohesive, um, especially, I mean, catering for the star uh, player as a cohesive team, that's very strong. But if there are fights behind the scenes, it doesn't work. Anyway, so that, that's back to the sports analogy. Um, but, but I think it's, it's really what, what is the team coming out um, in terms of, and, and, and I think, Will, to, to your point, I think there's a, a few things that are true almost no matter where you are. I think you don't necessarily want to ship bugs to production, right? So <laughs> less bugs in production is probably <laughs> a good metric that everyone agrees to. Controversial thought there. Like, I don't want <laughs> bugs in production. Like, someone, someone's going to disagree with you somewhere, Marcus. I'm, I'm sure. And to be honest, I think what is a challenge if you're, and I think, I think of my role, I mean, this is, uh, Vistaprint is a sizable business and, you know, order management, you don't necessarily want to give away orders for free because your payment didn't work or you want to block things at checkout. So it's a serious thing. You need to move very slow at some point. And for example, for my team, it is like an interesting thing. Oh, this is a new thing. Don't, don't work like you work in your usual environment. Just like have a hackathon type of experience or have one person go off on basically an island for a week and come back and have this zero to 80% solution out there. You're not going to break anything in code. You're not going to make any customers unhappy, but it allows you to move fast. Um, so basically a little bit of an unconventional approach. So yes, yeah, shipping bugs into production, it might actually, there might be some use cases around, you know, prototypes, early things. Um, then you haven't figured out the exact product market fit. That said, I still argue that like, you know, always scale down on features and have the right quality because otherwise when you ship something with little features that are all buggy, you're not going to make a product market fit. Um, so you're, yeah. as a director of engineering, you've got like four, five, 10 teams reporting to you. I, I mean, I'm not sure that number is totally relevant. So when you're saying engineering excellence, like you're actually putting these expectations on your individual teams to, uh, is it deliver faster? Is it to deliver more of the right thing related to the business? How, like, how are you actually evaluating your teams on on this? Is it a metric you're even using to evaluate or is it just, is it, is it some idea? What What is that for you? I'm definitely the, the person who is more in the idea than, I mean, I'm, I'm very much data driven in terms of once I figure something out, I wanna, wanna you know, chase that metric and obviously, you know, within reasons, because like chasing one metric, you're ignoring the other ones. So you always need the, the counterbalance. Um, but, you know, there's this, this interesting discussions of, yeah, not sure if I want to go there, but like, if you're doing the second or third, like even when you run AWS 
elastic Kubernetes service. But then you need this Kubernetes thing is out of lifetime, right? You need to move to the next version. You can close your eyes and hit that upgrade button in place, upgrade and hope for the best. And um, you might be lucky, um, but it's a little bit like, I don't feel confident, <laughs> you know, there's this, this order is coming in every other second, right? I mean, this is, is, is not something what you want to play with. Um, and once you have start having those discussion, like there's other solutions out in the world where you're not even in that problem. Those other solutions might or might not be a fit for the team, right? It's not saying we should go elsewhere, but we're definitely having active discussions around that because we're, our customers are not, pay, not buying a Kubernetes upgrade from us. They are buying sure. business cards, <laughs> bottles, t-shirts, all those type of things in our case, or in, in other cases might be different things. And, and so it needs to come with this reality check on, you know, what's, I mean, What's this total cost of ownership is the old style version of saying it probably <clears throat> or very mechanical way. And then you come up with your business case. But I think this is if things come up constantly and that could be this a service is constantly making problems and creating noise. You want to dive deep. Is it engineering excellence? It could also be that other partners in the business are, you know, not aware of what they're causing. Like, you know, think of some configuration elsewhere, three layers down in the system, and you have no idea, um, or they, they might be disconnected from what actually that is causing. It might call, cause customer complaints, and it's very, very indirect and very, very slow feedback loop. And um, so sometimes it's not, you know, the problem might not be technical. It might be a process problem, but generally this is also part of excellence, but they're getting a little bit further into Excellence of a team, excellence of a product team, excellence of an organization. And I, I think, you know, yeah, I'm definitely more qualified to talk about engineering excellence. I mean, I like the Kubernetes example. Uh, so if we say bad engineering excellence is just closing your eyes and clicking the upgrade button, or maybe closing your eyes and just letting AWS charge us more money because it's on the extended lifetime support strategy. What, what, what is good engineering excellence in that, in that situation? Like, what would you expect there uh, on that spectrum? Um, generally, I think, you know, maintenance should be low or reasonable for the value you create as a business uh, or as a team. And, you know, what's the value what you create? Sometimes it is more tied to a revenue stream and other, other times it's more tied to something a little bit at the side. It's, you know, it doesn't necessarily be a, a dollar metric, um, but it needs to... You know, not, not sure what, what other companies and teams generally have in their mind, but I would argue, you know, 30% is stuff that engineers need to do to maintain the status quo. Um, and then, you know, there's this admin overhead, but then the majority of it should be to move the product forward, to move the projects forward. Um, that comes with coding, that comes also with non-coding activities. Uh, and really doing good for the customer. And you want to increase that share of the you know, the maintenance activity. So maintenance comes with a certain, you know, in, in, in my environment, so a little bit of a large company, there's certain things that are must-dos by a given date, uh, certain upgrades, uh, certain compliance aspects and so on. And those, you know, those covering, you know, 10-ish percent, and they might come up with some spikes and some lows and so on. Uh, and the rest is, I'm interested in the team rather spending this 30% time in figuring out a new service or new workload version to run or a new technique or uh, documentation also thing versus, yeah, this is what we do twice a year. We just do it, right? And think of, think of something simpler than, than Kubernetes is password rotation. You probably want to get into a rhythm of rotating your password. Initially, you might say, yeah, it's just three. Let's do it manually. And at some point, you have 50. And at some point, like, oh, this is a problem, right? And Sure, give this to a junior person to to onboard, to learn the systems, and they go into 50 places and update those. Um, at some point, someone comes in and does some automation around this. And at some point, you think, why do I even have those passwords? So I'm, so there is where it's, yes, I'm going a little bit by feeling it by noise, but then um, I'm fortunate to have, to have access to a lot of data of saying how many, what's the average password age? What's the rotation of it? 
what's it over the timeline? And the timeline is very strong. Like if it goes up and you actually want to go it down or the other way around, it's like you can start acting before it explodes. And I think that's a really, really important thing. So thinking of, you know, this Kubernetes thing, it's not the worst thing what I have in my team. Um, by far not. It's actually serving a lot of value. <laughs> <laughs> Those were things, right? From a pure engineering perspective, right? Um, and uh, uh, but nevertheless, it is distractions, and we're having you know fifty plus, seventy plus services, and each of that needs kind of a redeployment to a new cluster if you want to move it over. And then, like, even if you bring down the hour, like, let's just assume one hour per service. That's fifty, seventy hours per year, which is a week. Given you have, there's 30 plus engineers working on the whole thing for the year and doing that once or twice a week, it's an okay thing. But not having that in the first place, that's an even better thing. With 30 hours, you can do quite a bit of other things that might actually drive forward. So that is, for example, we have not yet decided whether we want to get off of it or not. But what I'm excited about, the team now looks at, should we do something else? And very specifically, AWS ECS is a very you know, natural uh, follow-up in, in staying on AWS, but, you know, different cloud providers will have very similar workload and options and more managed versus less managed services. Maybe this is an unfair interpretation of engineering excellence, and maybe Will will, will give me a thumbs up here or, or down on how off I am. I, I, I think maybe another way of looking at this is challenging the status quo in a way which may identify that what we have could be categorized as tech debt. And I don't like the word tech debt a lot, but maybe what you're saying is, you know, what, what do we have right now? Is it actually the systems that we want in play, actually the technology we want to be using, the stack, the programming language frameworks, you know, are they actually the thing that we want to be using or should it be something else? And I, I think the point you made, Marcus, uh, is that none of these things have anything to do with delivering the business value on a short term time scale. But there's like a long term implication here and an expectation that the teams are asking themselves, hey, you know, this technology you're using, should you even have to rotate passwords? You know, this thing that you're doing constantly that you may be baked into tradition doesn't necessarily make sense. I don't know. I don't know if I'm right yeah, there. Absolutely. And I think this is, I think challenging the status quo of what you're doing constantly. I mean, look, look at, look at the world, what it was 10 years ago and what, what services did you are favorite cloud provider have out there. Um, I mean, by now they're just exploding in service and sometimes it's just like kind of a fake service on top of three of their other services, but all services are also getting better, right? So I think that is, um, and, and, and they, they find their very own uh, product market fit and, and just look at something like S3, what you were able to do 10 years ago versus now how much of an important pillar that is, for example, for data lakes and other things. Like who would have put the data and do SQL statements on top of an S3 bucket? Nobody. But today, that that that's how the big data warehouses actually make money, right? And and like this, this is how technology evolves. Look at, you know, we made chat jokes about front-end frameworks. Look at where they where they came from and what are they doing today? And like including things like, you know, those server-side versions of it on, on how you can render. Uh, things, um, and, and and I think it's it's we should challenge basically every day. What are we doing? Is this really necessary? And think of how could we do things differently. At the same time, I think there is a beauty of not classifying something just because it's old as tech death, but saying, "Look at <laughs> you're you're milking the cow here, right? You haven't invested much, but it still works." Um, and uh, you know, I think there might uh, there might be a serverless function out there. Yes, you might need to upgrade. I don't know the library version once a year, but it still does the thing. It's not necessarily tech dev. Would you would you design the system exactly like that from scratch? Potentially not, because the world has changed. But it's still good enough and not worth changing. And like, you know, identifying those tipping points, when is it actually a value or an asset and when, when, when does it start to become a liability is an interesting uh, thing to think of. Um, but I would not classify any programming language or any past decisions as necessarily tech debt. Um, but, you know, when you think of where is the world going in terms of, you know, 
relational databases were that thing. Um, and you know, 10 years ago, it was still that thing. If NoSQL started to be a lot of things, but these days when you hire someone off the university, they don't know how to write SQL statements anymore because that's not being taught in school. They only learn NoSQLs and blob storage and all those things. I think it's the right thing to teach to them. But see, <laughs> knowing <laughs> SQL is actually a good skill to have. Um, so, you know, does my team have a bunch of relation database? Yes. Is it worthwhile changing that? I don't think so. Is it, is it worthwhile maintaining it to something where you say, no, we are satisfied with the cost performance, um, backup failures, all the, the, the whole criteria? Yes, absolutely. We need to tame the beast if you want, right? Um, but not all workloads require things on, you know, this horizontal scalability and other effects what you can actually get out of um, NoSQL databases. Um, so that doesn't mean just because you have this thing, you need to get off of it, but you need to identify at some point it might be, oh, now is the right time to move. It might come as a project. It might come with something. I'm, I'm wondering about the who, who, who spends the effort doing this. Uh, and I, I think maybe this is where maybe the sort of thing that drove forward the DevOps mindset in the first place, the movement towards DevOps, uh, the idea that uh, more attention needs to be on evaluating the excellence of our of the engineering that we're doing and maybe there's a cultural component to it that not everyone is has the sort of mindset to look at what we're doing today and actually improve it or fundamentally having to change what we're doing uh that that can be scary for lots of people as well so i, I feel like there's an aspect there which could have driven the devops uh, mindset which was you know, maybe a different team is responsible for infrastructure and maybe the sort of product teams say, hey, other teams in our company are fundamentally responsible for uh, doing this innovation, deciding which version of Kubernetes or whether or not we're using serverless functions, et cetera. Uh, is, is there an aspect where every team should be doing something in their own domain? Or do we think we've moved, the industry has moved in a direction where a lot of these decisions are, we've already identified which team is fundamentally responsible for making them? Well, I think I think it's at the engineers' heart to actually make improvements in their own realm, right? I think there's okay. companies that say, "Hey, we have a central um, team that you know manage certain things." I'm like, "Hey, by the way, provide a link to a GitHub repository, and magic happens, right?" And this is this is the script what you need to put there, um, and and here's some config what you can you know how how it scales. That's a very valuable approach to do it. And I think the approach today will also be different than the approaches that were done uh, you know, 10 years ago with basically sysops and database ops and managing deployments manually and failures and you know local local things versus cloud, cloud versions and so on. Uh, and there is that the way is hey, you you build it, you run it as a basically as a product team or as a small um, development team uh, of you know two pizza teams type of size, right? Like 10 ish people in total. Uh, but no matter what model you are, you have different responsibilities. Your task is really going into this whole DevOps um, from, from you know, prototyping to delivering to testing to, to also running in production, including your you know, on-call schedule, or it's a little bit more, um, you only, you know, you, depending, there might be some handover for, for monitoring. Um, but in both ways, you have areas where you want to improve. It could be on, you should definitely be interested, like when we look at very technical metrics, error rate, response rate, latencies, certain things you might have a little bit more leverage in one model versus the other, um, but you should be interested to understanding your craft, which is in the end, it is, could be two ways, right? One is really just writing the code um, and writing that in a way that scales in terms of features, but also in terms of performance. Um, and, and probably many, many other angles, right? And, and you know, not testability and all sorts of things. Um, so, so that that's definitely one angle. But there is, I think, when we go a little bit, you build it, you run it model, you also have this, you architect potentially differently. Because running workloads in the cloud, especially when you go into a little bit more of these async processing type of things, right? You have an event, 
and something can happen in the back, background. So think of an order being taken in into the system. There's a bunch of things that are happening, but the customers don't need to wait for that. They don't need to wait until this thing gets shipped out <laughs> while the browser spins for two weeks. That's not really, really right. So, so there is a lot of these, these aspects, but like, uh, how would you architect something from scratch given the latest technology that the cloud providers provide? That requires constant challenging because like five plus years ago, it was SNS and SQS on Amazon. But now with EventBridge, it's just like so many more features. And then how do you do that between teams? Do you still go through either a REST or GraphQL or so API? Or do you actually hook up some teams internally through some of those, you know, cloud native event systems? Um, there, there's many ways to get there and like all ways can lead to excellence in the very context. Um, but I think just saying, yeah, we made this decision five plus years ago is yes, but you're missing out on, you can delete these three services that are just moving data around, which is solved by this configuration over here on the cloud provider now. So I think if you're not doing these type of things, um, and I'm assuming cloud deployment now and not any, any other type of deployments, like, yes, it keeps your team busy. It keeps potentially team efficient. They might even have engineering excellence within that code, but not owning that code at all, but moving that to configuration and let Amazon, who is or Google Cloud or Azure, scale that for you and manage that for you. That, that's really where scalability and excellence also definitely comes in. You said something really interesting about the uh, amount of time a team should be dedicated to engineering excellence. I, I think you just sort of dropped it in there, this 30% number. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, as another perspective here, uh, maybe, Will, you've got one. Like, how much time do, you, do teams feel like uh, in and around you, uh, how much time they actually have to invest in this? Because I know... Uh, even at smaller company scale or larger ones, I, I know there's like some expectations that go around, but then you have maybe some product managers that come in and say, no, we have to just deliver. You know, how, how do you like, do, do, we, do teams actually get that time uh, to do this? Or is it about cutting out the, that time and actually saying no, right? You know, even though we have all this feature work to do, we still need to spend this amount of time really looking at what we've got and questioning our status quo. Do, like our engineers actually being given that capability or is this just, you know, a nice thing to say and doesn't happen in practice? Yeah, it definitely happens in practice for uh, my environment. Um, it's more or less depending on teams. And, and I think it's, you know, the response, my direct responsibility to enable that in a team. And, you know, we are working with, you know, alongside product and alongside UX. So it's, it's, it's my thing to defend that time, right? Otherwise, I mean, it's just one part of my job. Um, but, you know, the company also values engineering practices a lot. Um, so, so there is a bunch of that filter uh, filled by already central things, right? Mandatory upgrades, mandatory things. Um, also, what we're doing as part of quarterly planning is we're showing, okay, how much do you spend on things that someone else tells you to do on the feature side? Things that you actually want to do for your customer because you understood the problem and really trying to do that. And then things basically in this whole engineering excellence uh, and so on. Even so, I think that it's probably the wrong word. We, we rather call that you know, this maintenance moving forward. So I think there is this excellence part, which I think is an, is not necessarily reported out there. Um, but I think that is something as, as the engineering leaders, they are definitely responsible to get that into the teams and the, the mindset of the teams and the individuals, right? Every individual is 40 hours a week. Um, sometimes it can be someone is passionate about following block podcast like this one and it comes out with a cool idea to to actually start others are following you know some news and others are actually interested in, in reading the documentation on the cloud provider or SaaS provider whatever and saying hey there's a new technique let's try it out i encourage really everyone to do that that's way harder to do and get that into the mindset of everyone um versus the others is a lot of more you know leadership driven and saying hey by the way we need to do this for the long-term health and it comes a little bit as yeah, the expectation is that you're looking to that problem space. I, I think that there's a lot of um, 
So let me say this. If your definition of excellence is defined correctly, I think a lot of the time and effort it takes to achieve excellence just happens natively. And I'll use an example of like a sports team. You know, every member of a sports team has a different definition of excellence, but each te- uh, each team member's definition of excellence supports the definition of excellence above that. So if you start at like the, the franchise owner, their definition of excellence is to sell as many tickets to their games as possible. But then you get down to the coach and the coach's definition of excellence is to hire the best quality of players for the team that creates a well-performing team that sells the most number of tickets possible. And when you get to an individual team player, that person's job may be to, you know, catch the ball and move the ball downfield or to defend against the ball being moved or, or whatever their specific role is for that sport so that their team performs better so that they have the support of the fans so that they sell more tickets to the games. And so each one of those people have, has a different definition of excellence, but they all support each other going all the way up. And then whenever you get down to that individual team player, they know that they have to catch the ball or defend the ball or, or whatever. And that's their metric that they measure against. And so it's easy for them to make decisions that either support or don't support that definition of excellence because it's clearly defined with what they do and how that supports the overall organization. I mean, I feel like you two just keep picking up the, you know, football analogy I here think just you, to stick it in me because both my teams have, have been kicked out of their uh, associated competitions. <laughs> right. Well, I'll be honest. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan for American football, so I have no idea how you define excellence because clearly I don't understand the game. <laughs> So I, I think where you were going to is to me is a little bit the the business metrics, right? Basically the KPIs that are, are very outcome driven. Um, and uh, I think the excellence part in that relation to sports would be how how do people show up day to day on that training, not necessarily on the match, but almost more on the training. How do they challenge each other to become better? What's the unique training plan that they have that is, or it could be also, you know, they bring in the coach and say, by the way, now we know what a competing team does, so we can actually outperform them through through the brain instead of through the body, basically. Um, so I think that is, that to me, there where it starts to be really, yes, everyone does that. Everyone wants to sell more tickets. Everyone wants to be, have the best coach. Everyone wants to have the best players and basically get the best performance out of the, the value invested. But I think this, this the, the excellence is not achieved by that. That's really achieving it by management, by, you know, there is a lot of value and that's needed in a corporation, that's needed in, in a corporation like sports and a, a corporation, uh, you know, like a business brand. Um, but this excellence um, around, like, how can I, how can I be innovative in my training? How can I be innovative in my nutrition? How can I be innovative in, in, uh, the tactics during the game. That's, I think, where where's the next level. And, and also, you can't follow school books. You need to come up with your own approaches and more unconventional, or potentially not necessarily your own, but at least you need to read through those unconventional approaches, try them out, adopt them to your needs. Um, so that that's a little bit this type of how I would distinguish that, uh, where it's engineering excellence. This is, you know, I think I was conflating those a little bit before as I went to do the other topic. But I think there's there's where I would like to draw a line on on their excellent starts and their, you know, engineering practices or, you know, other things are there to just like establish a baseline. I think you you really touched on an interesting aspect here uh, because I do reme- remember reading a paper about how in order to actually get better, we need to do that thing called practice. And if we only do the execute production thing, uh, you know, show up to the games all the time, 
uh, we won't get that practice in. And the practice is where we have the opportunity to really change up what we're doing or learn more. And I do see the industry moving sort of at, at the moment more away from that and forgetting that we need to do the practice. So maybe the engineering excellence really is what do you do during your software development, your engineering practice sessions? You know, what are you doing there? How are you evaluating this? And there was a, a bunch of years ago, there was actually a documentary, uh, a soccer documentary uh, that was recording Neymar, and, the Brazilian soccer player. And they used uh, 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 brain diodes to uh, uh, identify how much he's thinking during a game versus practice. And it, the interesting thing was that the, the actual amount that you're thinking during, during production is very low, like almost no brain activity at all. Uh, when measured. Whereas during practice, there's a lot of thought that goes into it, into that practice. And I don't know if there's a direct corollary here, but I mean, it really made me think of this, uh, that maybe the engineering excellence is challenging how we're practicing day to day so that we're ready to do the actual production work. And what does that even look like in the software uh, engineering domain? I don't know if that's well, I think a question. You have to deploy the production <laughs> button, right? <laughs> Yeah, for I know, sure. I know, but it's like the deploy the production button is such a thing. Can you do that calmly, or can you only do that, um, uh, you know, under stress, right? And that the practice in this case, uh, I mean, be, that's always stressful for you me. Know, the testing the automation, the error detection, the rollback you have, uh, but the the actual result is that you have calm when you push that button. Yeah, that's really that's a um, that's got, that's got me thinking a lot, Warren. We're it feels like in some circumstances, like our job every day, we're showing up to game day and there is no training time. Doesn't it? Yeah. So it's like how, and I'm, I'm thinking about that twofold, like one, yeah, it would be super cool to have training time to just like at a very fundamental level, go do a test to compare ECS to EKS and like, get enough experience to have an informed opinion as to whether or not we should be making that migration between the two. Um, but from a business perspective, oops, from a business perspective, you know, do I want to fund my business in such a way so that my employees have time to go and do that stuff? Or do I want them game day every day? Like if I'm just purely focused on the numbers of my business. I want them. I want every day to be game day, regardless of the the implications on them for that. So there's like a there's a trade off there that I can't quite wrap my head around at the moment. There was this joke. Uh, I don't know how based in reality it was about a manager talking to the I don't know head of engineering saying, "Hey, you know, our engineers need to be trained better. You know, that takes a lot of money and effort and time. Uh, you know, can we just utilize them? Uh, what if they're not good enough, right? You know, what if I mean, I don't think no one's perfect, as we pointed out. They don't maximize the number of lines of code or business value, and so we do need to train them. And the concern is, what if we train them and they leave?" And the manager's response is, what if we don't train them and they stay? Right. <laughs> Marcus, you were going to say something. Absolutely. But I think, I mean, tra training is a hard one to, to really um, make, you know, there's some people who are just like embracing it. Um, uh, and, and others, it's just like hard. And also I see it in my daily schedule. It's really very really hard to get it in. I mean, what works well for me is going running uh, over lunch and listening into a podcast. That's one form of media consumption that works and it's not just like the doom scrolling type of value, but it's actually, you know, building up some some more thoughts and, and it's also a have the, the space time there. Uh, but I think, you know, in terms of where you, you might have been going, Bill, is I think there is a space where it's just like there's constantly noise around the team. That's when you potentially even management will come in and they typically send, that's when the consultants show up and when management shows up <laughs> and, you know, weird reporting and someone looks at how many virtual requests did you do yesterday. That's a really bad sign. That's when you have underinvested. Uh, I think there I'm talking to is already like, yes, you're bringing up the point does, is it valuable to do this or not? Right. So we try to sneak in those type of things at the side a little bit. 
Um, I think there's certain things that are definitely of high value of, you know, think of not having passwords at all. It's just like way simpler um, to manage. And it's also possible today. Five plus years ago, it was very, very hard to do. Um, and these days the systems have evolved. So I think this is, again, like adjusting to where is the world today. And, you know, the world has just innovated AI in the last, I don't know, feels like last three days. And there's this whole whole hype cycle. Yeah, the world is moving fairly fast, right? <laughs> or, you know, the cloud didn't exist 10 years ago. That's only a decade. Well, or, you know, depending on what's the starting point of the cloud, there's probably IBM saying the cloud exists for the last 40 years in their own word. Um, there's this different definition of that. But it, it's, it's really, really moving fast, right? And uh, uh, and not keeping up with that is, I think, it gets you into a situation where at some point a company might say, we need to stop and we need a year to overhaul our technology infrastructure. Um, and that's a really, really hard job to do from a team perspective, from a morale perspective, from actually, can you achieve that outcome? Um, and, you know, how can you... Yeah, keep the customers happy and so on. So I think this this is the, the balance of uh, of that. Nevertheless, I think after that, even if you don't, if you say, okay, scale down on this bucket of making things better for the sake of making it better, is and I think as an engineer, you, you just want to have that. You want to have this drive. You want to show off. And I think this is also the opportunities that individuals have in corporations, no matter what uh, role they have and what level, it is to showing off and saying, I understand this technique, here's a documentation, and you know it might become the de facto standard how things are being done in the company because it comes with the context of the company. It comes with that, this is how we do deployments, this is how we run things, this is the responsibility, these are in the incentives. And if someone is able to, to document it in a way or to create, a, create some shared code that's easy to reuse and so on, I think that's really, really powerful. and. Um, and allows also fairly junior engineers to shine. They might, they might actually, the biggest struggle for them might be to put it out into the world, especially when it's an internal world. It's almost hard to put it out there in the world and nobody might see it. That's easy. But putting it out internally right. and you have an intent, you have a purpose for that. It's like you need, you need some cheerleading from, you know, the basically the uh, directors of engineering or, you know, your team leads or others to, to actually put it into a shape that is not going to annoy the others, but it's actually being appreciated. And that is really company and political context that you need to fully understand to make sure that you uh, can do that. But it's, I think it's a big opportunity for everyone, um, and especially for more junior or just like very technical savvy person who don't want to deal with that, but actually would be interested to, to have that better excellence across all the teams and not just for themselves. So is that part of your definition of engineering excellence is promoting, promoting internal things within the teams and, and supporting them and like mandating that feedback loop to encourage excellence? Not necessarily mandating, but this is what I, I encourage you to do this. You so this damn it. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I, I think I think I rather would put put that in and, and here we go less into the excellence part, we go more into how do you manage the people and how do you grow the people is I want to encourage everyone um, on the opportunities are endless. Um, and yes, day to day this is hard first to identify the right thing for the right person and so on. But like just simply the topics that are on my plate, it's around security. It's about infrastructure. It's about front end parts. It's about back end parts. It's about, you know, potentially libraries. It's about upgrades, it's about deployment techniques. It's about challenging how we do run things in the cloud. It might be a SaaS provider we're using and, oh, we're using that suboptimal and so on. It is endless. And I think as you are an engineer, you are seeing these things. And I'm here, I'm not even talking about the bugs you're seeing in your own system and the and, and the error reports and other things, right? This is another part where you hopefully, hopefully that's your first home, which is try, try make sure that the customers are happy, right? That's that's the first part where you want to use the the data in terms of 
oh, we had 47 errors in this time frame. Um, we should probably bring it down. <laughs> or no, this is really kind of the, the maximum how we like we just decided in the team with with you know senior input to no this 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 is good, right? Uh, this is really world class where, where you can be. Um, but then all the other topics, it is just raise your arm and you will be welcome because a lot of those topics might not be so passionately uh, done by by many it might just be more as an admin task or I do the minimum versus those are really unbound and you can have an impact that is way across teams uh, way outside of your sphere of direct influence and day to day so it's both in the day to day and how do you make yourself and your team better and your software you're directly supporting as well as the opportunity out there of if you do things slightly more generic share it slightly further um, or you know, raise your arm on you know becoming you know the security expert in your team, and you learn all that, and then you start looking at the data yourself, and then start questioning why are you doing it this way. Start improving it in your own team, then starting sharing. Hey, this is what we did. Those are the three steps. It's that easy. Like, oh, once it's easy, others will also do it. Versus this nebulous thing of, you know, <laughs> we might need to invest some. Uh, some technical spike time at some point and it's in the backlog or the back of our minds of people and it's never getting to versus simplifying it, paving the path so others can just walk it. And then hopefully if they're paved path, you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You're just walking there because you trust your colleagues uh, and the combination of those also like appreciating this is one way of doing it might not be the perfect way, but it helps you accelerate. So it's, it's both ways. It's not only the sharing, it's also taking what's there. It's weird, I think, that we put so much emphasis on needing to train up sort of inexperienced or junior engineers. But then when it comes to uh, the, or the teams as a whole or more senior engineers, I, I think there's a tendency to forget that there's an opportunity there to spend time actually reviewing what we're doing and like how we're working or how we're doing it effectively, uh, even at an individual level. Uh, and I'm not really sure where that comes from. Maybe it's like once you reach senior engineer, like that's it, you know, companies like that's it, you know, you're, you're as successful as you need to be for us. And junior engineers, as long as you learn our systems, you're as successful as you need to be for us. But there is still that learning aspect there. And I'm wondering if it's enough to just say, spend, take 30% of your time to learn new things, to listen to the Adventures in DevOps podcast. Uh, or, you know, use new technologies and new UI frameworks or whether or not there's something that we need to directly encourage to make that happen effectively. I, I think it has to be a much more active role because it's far too easy for individuals, especially junior ind individuals, to see tickets in their backlog or work that's assigned to them and prioritize that over learning and education, even whenever we say, hey, you should be spending time on learning and education. Um, I don't think you can take a passive role in just telling them that and then assuming that they're doing it. I think it's something that you have to actively manage and track, whether that's, you know, telling them, hey, open a ticket and log your time when you're listening to the podcast or, you know, or, or whatever the metric is. I, I think it has to be something that's that's um, active and measurable. I mean, they're not necessarily going to know either, right? Like they're in a, you're in a spot, your team is in a spot where even if you said, Hey, you know, spend a lot of your time on this, like what is the right activities that you should be doing or the right knowledge you should be gaining? Uh, and maybe that's why we, I think as an industry, we fall back into like watch these YouTube videos or uh, go to some conferences as if that's, you know, uh, the right way to just automatically make this happen. But I feel like that may be even a little bit too passive as well, right? You know, there's this, a lot of information floating around that doesn't necessarily convert into actual concrete learning that can be applied back into what we're doing day to day. Yeah, for sure. I think from my perspective, like whenever I first started going to conferences, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to learn so much. And now I look at conferences as a way to completely screw up my inbox where I'll never get a valid email again because of all the mailing lists I get subscribed to by going to the conference. 
Minor, minor LinkedIn connections are totally like I just got back uh, from Germany last week. And like, I, I don't know who these people are that ha- are connected with me. Like I try to, you know, approve all of them. And I'm like, I don't remember you. I'm sorry. Uh, for, for, for sure. I did learn something, though, as a speaker, I actually learned something really interesting. And that's it amazes me how many companies have on premise data centers. Uh, or they're renting a data center from a uh, third-party provider where they're pretty much getting bare metal that they're putting stuff on. And they don't have a need for this. Like they're, they're not at a level or scale or industry that requires it. It's, it's really quite amazing that there's just still so many in this field. And I wonder if it's a lack of engineering excellence that has left them there. I, 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 is, I is the thing, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's been a resurgence in going to the data data center over the last few years. And I've know quite a few people who are using the cost of AWS and GCP yeah. as the driver for yeah. that. But um, I'm not conv- completely convinced on that for like, if you like know what your workload is and it's pretty consistent and well defined, I think if you had a good data center provider that could send someone out to swap failed hard drives and replace NIC cards and and all that kind of stuff, it might work. But I don't know. That's that's I putting mean, a lot of faith in that. You're in a, you're, I, I mean, for sure. I mean, you're in an interesting area, though, Will, because like. I feel like you deal with a lot of companies uh, at Polygon that are in this weird domain that aren't necessarily cloud, cloudish, public cloudish optimized, right? Uh, I mean, consensus networks and uh, um, cryptocurrency companies, et cetera. Like, I, I get that, but there are just so many like uh, companies out there that are startups or even larger companies that are spending sixty million plus uh, dollars, euros, francs a year. Uh, who who think that there are uh, a benefit there, Marcus? You were going to say something. Yeah, I think I think you, you you. It's a nice segue to to one of the thoughts I I have, and and I was talking about hey, there is this baseline, but then comes the innovation in it, and innovation is a lot of different things. Like we talked about education, we talked about you know, uh, you know, figuring out and taking on additional responsibilities and so on. But one of those thoughts I have is is basically, and and it comes exactly where it's, oh my god cloud is so expensive is cost per compute is kind of a term that I came up and made up myself, but it's like, what's the cost you're spending for the compute you're using? Um, And, uh, you know, basically even in the cloud, you run things on a virtual machine by definition, you don't want this to be more than 10 or 20% CPU and you want to have at least, I don't know, 50% memory free. So you're pay- paying uh, paying the money what you should have in your pocket and you do your team's bonuses into the bonuses of the cloud providers, right? Um, this is, they are, they're charging for a CPU, which they are actually not using. It's all this yeah. shared hosting environment. So that's their game, right? And that's their margin. Um, and, and yet it is relatively... Um, Attractive. So I think this is also where this innovation comes in. So how do you actually bring, like, like, I think if you optimize cost per compute, so not purely cost, because purely cost optimization is just like turn everything off and you're done, right? Very simple. <laughs> right. It's a lot of a business, so you will never ever have cost again. Um, and, and I think the alternative is just like run everything on AWS Lambda or whatever your serverless function is might also not be uh, the answer. Uh, that also doesn't say you cannot use relation database. You must use DynamoDB or MongoDB or whatever it may, might be. Um, it comes with way more nuance, but generally, if you look at your cloud spend, cloud spend is fairly easy because you get your statistics over time and everything you can analyze and tag things and so on. So it, it's, it's quite, you can have this, this engineering heart and start with the data and be data driven, just try to iterate there. But look at the top five they're probably consuming 50%, 40%, 80% of, of, of your money, right? Some of that is justified because that's actually the workload that's running there. Others are just like, wait a bit. Uh, you know, it's waiting. It's, 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 it's mostly the margin on over-provisioning. Mm. This is, yep. you know, relation databases. You need, there's no way to scale up and scale down 
at least not, you know, there is a way, oh, by the way, we have a peak season for two months, so we scale up for the next instant and scale down again, or increase the distance. So slow moving scalability can do, but those even during the days are very hard to do. And if it's more spiky, almost impossible to do. Uh, but you are paying for, for your, <laughs> for your risk and gut feeling a little bit almost like, I mean, obviously, hopefully you look at data, look at maximum requests, did some load testing and everything, but like, yeah, there might be this one customer coming along and put some load on it. Like I want to be prepared for that. Right. And, and you need to be prepared as a business for that. And you need to be over provision versus the more you go um, to basically really pay per use. If there's nobody coming, it's zero cost. If someone is coming, why don't you pay what you use? This again has at some point, it has a limit and it might be, I do my own thing, is cheaper, right? So at some point, um, you know, running certain things on a huge scale with a central team that has expertise there might be the better thing for some companies. Um, or running again back to bare metal. I mean, there's just a little bit of a hype of, oh, we run this thing on bare metal. There are those workloads. But they typically don't come from a startup. They don't come from, you know, smallish, two pizza-sized teams running their own thing. Even if they have a lot of requests, those requests are typically, uh, you know, request in, do some processing, call a database, return the thing. Um, and, and like, I think cost per compute is a nice proxy to say, do I have a spot where my top five or top three things and that's just looking at the pure cost, right? There comes the operational cost and other things that you need to encounter. But at least this is hard data what you can look at and try to optimize for that. And at some point, I'm good now. I feel like the cost spent is valid. And I think, you know, a lot of companies might not have done that or might not have incentivized the team and so, oh, my cloud costs are so expensive. Um, but then, you know, really running that very same workload it's the very same properties. People can just spin up things and other things. You paint that on the rack now. <laughs> you know, how many servers need to have in there to actually have for those spikes? Because like scaling up and down doesn't make sense anymore. Just like put it on full I'm, load, and that's what you're what you're what you're having in there. I think there's some inspiration from the Web three space that sort of coined the term gas fee right? The, the actual cost of that execution compute to the line of execution for per instruction. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what that, that means, but I, I mean, I think there is an interesting aspect here where when we deal with the physical goods and we have a, a capital expenditure, you buy a thing and then you depreciate the value over time because the metal rusts or the components get out of date or you know, whatever it is about those, uh, however it's manufactured or being consumed. Uh, we sort of lost that as we switched to uh, from capital or CapEx uh, expenditures to operational expenditures, which I think we're rewarded for having. Hey, you know, don't upfront buy this because there is, you know, it's going to depreciate over time. You know, take a car, for instance, you buy a car, it gets worse over time. It's worth nothing after you drive it off of the lot and then you drive it for another 10 years and then it, it rusts and it's gone. Right. Whereas, you know, if you're renting the car, you always get the newest, latest version. And if you never drive anywhere, then it's, you don't pay anything. It's, you know, conceivably, but I feel like there is a middle ground here where a lot of companies end up in and they forget that even things like EC2 or Kubernetes, there, there is a capital expenditure. It's just not on the bare metal. It's not on the virtual machine, potentially. It's, it's this other aspect, you know, it's slightly higher. It's not a all OpEx or all CapEx, but somewhere in between. And because we've gotten away from that, I feel like we've lost people paying attention to how much we're actually uh, expending on the part that's not fully operational, that, that's fully, uh, like you said, the total cost of ownership is, is one aspect to pull in here. And I, I mean, I don't know if there's a question here, uh, just sort of an interesting uh, tangent, I guess. No, I, I think, you know, just paying $1,000 every month is yeah. relatively easy to understand. And by the way, this, this is what yeah. my business costs versus every three years paying 30,000 or 50,000 is like, wait a bit, I'm not spending that money, right? And there's a huge <laughs> project running on just like trying, trying to do that, right? And that's yeah. just like the small numbers now, but now and I think you're often not using a thousand, but using a million, right? A, a million a month is one thing to pay, but then uh, have this $50 million bill every um, three, four years is a different type of discussion. And, 
And I think this is, as you optimizing the cost, you're not bringing the cost down by $10, $100, $1,000, $10,000, whatever your workload might be. You're bringing that down multiplied by, let's just multiply it to a year, right? And look at the yearly cost, right? Because at some point, you know, things change so much that it's very hard to follow along over the long term. Um, I think it's probably basic finance here, but also it's important <laughs> that team members, team members understand like, no, you're not bringing down this workload, you know, fixing a bug for one user. No, you're fixing a bug for one user a day, which is 365 users a year, or you buy, I don't know, whatever it is. And it's like, no, this is, this is a little bit where, you know, capital investment in terms of software engineering comes in. And, you know, some of that is on the product side, but I, I would argue some of that is on the engineering side of saying, if we fix these three things, that's the impact we have to the customers, to the business, to the cost, to whatever. Um, and that's, you know, we, if you invest an hour now, like you can basically count how many days or how many weeks it takes until the return of investment is. There are very simple things and there's very more complicated models, but like get the back of the napkin calculation into everyone's head and like, just like, yeah, make those decisions based on that. And if you're really good at this type of investing your time where there is a return and preferably return is on better customer service and better customer value, because that really fuels your business, right? So like all the engineering excellence aside, but where you can invest <laughs> and, you know, improve improve things from an engineering side, and it has also either direct or sometimes it's indirect. It's like, how do you measure downtime, right? If a team was is down once a once a month, pretty bad, right? Uh, all of a sudden, it's not down anymore. It's probably a good thing that happened. I don't know, X months in the past, um, but it probably didn't happen. Or the work changed coincidentally, right? It probably happened because someone stepped yeah, yeah, up right. and fixed the thing. Hmm. I mean, I, you come for the engineering excellence and get the, uh, you know, ex maybe startup entrepreneur here giving you financial advice on how to run your cloud. I, I mean, I, I love the topic. I feel I fear it's a it's another whole hour, uh, which I, <laughs> you're going off topic. Here, which right? you know, <laughs> no, I mean, super interesting. I, I mean, I I, I I really love the the idea. I actually, you know, I, I'm hoping maybe we can find someone to come on to actually. Uh, discuss that in detail because I think there is, as you pointed out, really interesting overlap with uh, the complexity of managing cloud resources or um, I'm sorry if you're on-prem. <laughs> if, if they're on-prem, they never heard the podcast because they're crawling underneath the floor running network cables or something. <laughs> that, actually, I am curious about that. If that's, if that's still a thing, like if you are running on-prem, are you still... For people who are running on prem, are they still jumping in the car, driving out to the data center, swapping hard drives, racking servers? I mean, I can imagine it's a separate job, uh, and there are the third party bare metal providers out there that are trying to sell that. So I think something that the even larger cloud providers offer, or how they work, is they end up renting like locked in space inside physical buildings that are called cages. Uh, that you can't get in. So who's doing that activity though? I, I'm, that is a good question, right? I mean, cause you don't want the data center owner to be a accessing your physical machines and, you know, pulling out the HSM that you've got installed there. Like that's, that's a security vulnerability. Uh, right. So you, you've got to have your own operation engineers that you're employing to perform that activity. Otherwise, you know, you might as well be using a public cloud. Uh, but, you know, if someone knows, I think they should ping us on Discord uh, and uh, actually, you know, give us a topic of conversation here. I think that'd be super interesting to have someone with an expertise in on-premise uh, data center management. Oh, absolutely. I'm 100% in on that one. I think that would especially be interesting for those that are, you know, medium company size. Not those very big players. Yeah. They might have other economics and other reasons to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, also, not those who have to do it for compliance reasons because they're well, because it's a thing and that's the reason why we do it. Uh, but really, like, you know, those have a decent engineering team, but those are not super. So, so I think a lot of people could actually relate and, and so on. So, yes, would be a fantastic topic. <laughs> yeah, I would like to yeah, have somebody funny. from. <laughs> well, yeah, because there's. Um... The email provider, hey.com, that was uh, started by um, 
I don't remember what his full name is. He goes by the initials DHH. He's like the founder of Ruby on Rails or something. But they have left the cloud completely, operate all their own physical hardware, and then just recently announced that they're ditching Kubernetes for their own orchestration platform that they have created. And like they're just like completely going off and and inventing their own stuff. And so I, I think that would be a really cool conversation to have and say, just, you know, how's that working out for you? Yeah. I, I think, I think what's interesting is, um, is, you know, where, where's the value of Kubernetes or these type of things, right? These big frameworks and these of, I mean, Kubernetes that, that came out of this Google project, right? And they run a few more servers than I do. Right, um, <laughs> and um, and 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 I think it, it goes down a little bit too. Often, many companies do either hey they have just like say some CPU needs or they have classical web request type of needs with a database, um, or they have some async processing kind of these serverless pipeline type of needs. I yeah. feel like if they were running. And I'm guessing here is Kubernetes really in the cloud in terms of how potential the cloud provider sell it and is the you know potentially the options that were there. I think that happened like three years ago when they announced it. Um, it, it it's different than oh, like you go all in on the cloud and figure out how can you you know cost per compute how like cost per compute were yeah. not good for them. How can you squeeze that out? I think there might have been a cloud way to do it, uh, and and those are you know top-notch engineers, I'm pretty sure they, they looked at a bunch of things. Um, but this is also one of the arguments, like why, you know, I, I was you know, looking at, I don't want this Kubernetes upgrade a year, but if it's there, it's not the worst thing, right? But there are other things like Kubernetes, you know, a lot of people put the stamp on a LinkedIn profile because they want to have the stamp. It's the wrong incentive, right? And it's, um, but it's also huge complexity to learn. I mean, learning Kubernetes is equally challenging as learning AWS or learning uh, Google Cloud or whatever it is, right? It's a huge thing and really, really mastering that and then scaling it to your needs and getting the right cost performance security profile. That's another undertaking versus most teams might actually just like, yeah, we have this Kubernetes in the cloud and fully managed. And uh, these are the seven settings we are looking at, right? And if right. you're doing that, it's probably like something like, you know, a more cloud native thing that is more or higher higher managed service like AWS has ECS. Um, you just a cluster has a name. That's all you can configure. And then you say, oh here's this service, <laughs> here's the Docker instance and that's give me so much CPU and, and memory and then hopefully that matches the wallet you're having. Um, and, and the workload you you're throwing against and has the right, right balance. But it matched this the auto scaling for you. It, like, okay, you need to configure that, right? But it's like it does all the magic. And the nice thing about it, in five years, if you never touch that code, okay, your own code might run into security vulnerabilities, but the underlying hardware has changed seven times, runs faster wow. by then, has sure. been gone through innovation cycles by the cloud provider and while doing nothing. So your code gets more secure and faster while doing nothing. This is a really, really beautiful thing to have than using managed services. And I think that's something that's undervalued and often like, you know, there's this on AWS, not sure how much we can go deep there versus others. Like there is, you back it by your own virtual machine and your own EC2 instance versus by Fargate, which is basically EC2 fleet managed by AWS. Uh, so you don't see them is looking at a one-to-one -one comparison, obviously backed by EC2 is cheaper because you manage it, you have the responsibility, but they also know there's so much free capacity there, what they can basically, or what they are charging you because you have to manage the capacity um, versus you're really only paying what you're needing. Um, so again, it's yet one level higher. So depending on where you are on the managed services, go one level higher and you get a bunch of things for free on maintenance, security, upgrades, maintainability. Um, and like, Again, strive there. Like, what's your next layer then after that? What's your next layer after that? At some point, I think there are two stopping points. some point, okay, I, I don't understand this thing anymore because it's too abstract. There's services out there. Oh, drop this thing 
and we kind of run it, right? And you want to have a little bit more control depending on, on your needs. Great for startups, great for, for uh, prototypes, great for demos, and great for certain workloads, um, but not necessarily everything. So that's one stopping point. And I think the other stopping point is when you don't, when it's not a managed service, but the managed service manages you kind of thing. It is <laughs> at some point, at some workload characteristic, they might become expensive. Um, a very classical one is the NAT gateway. You can just put it up, it's fairly cheap. But once you actually it hits traffic, at some point you think, should I run my own? <laughs> this costs me as much as it costs, right? And, and, and those are things that I, you know, I'm, I'm there going back to the, the hey conversation is like, yeah, should I run, not bare metal directly, but should I run my own here? And it's a slippery slope, right? I mean, it's from a cool, cool cost performance, uh, cost perspective, absolutely. It's probably also not that hard to run it. But then comes the whole security maintenance and nobody will have a clue of how, how this works because there you need to go deeper into networking and to routing tables and all other things what you need to understand. I don't necessarily want to spend that time there. But I fully understand companies that don't run this snap gate because it's just like hitting a limit where they want to spend the money. Um, yeah. So it's just I'm one example, sorry. right? So, so I think even managed services, they are not this is the way to go. There is orders, uh, what you need to set. And hey, by the way, here's, here's where we stop or here. Excellence actually means not doing this thing and so on. Yeah. No, I think that's a good, a good, uh, you know, circle back around to the you know beginning of the conversation, really like, you know, figuring out what decisions you want to make uh, and even what the space is to make those decisions is what, what we're calling excellent or engineering excellence. I, I fear that, uh, we may be taking up too much of your time and I, I have this thought that maybe we should move on to picks if there is no one last thing that you wanted to share. Oh, I feel I've talked so much and thanks for having me. So uh, just uh, go on. Yeah, I do want to chime in with one last thing and say that I think that Nat Gateways is an individual line item on the Amazon profit and loss balance sheet. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> right? Besides storage, storage is another one. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> They're like, we sold 500 million coffee makers last year, and it almost made us as much money as Nat Gateways. <laughs> Something like that. Oh my God, we could go into that direction, but let's 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 <laughs> from that. <laughs> right. Cool. Let's do picks. Warren, did you bring a pick this week? I did. I know usually it's a book, uh, but I just bought this thing. It's a Legion uh, from Lenovo. It's a tablet. I loved my uh, Google Nexus for forever. Uh, I think I had it like 10 years or so. Uh, never let me down up until last year where it just totally froze uh, for the most part. I, I blame the apps that I have to run. Like They just take up more and more memory and upgrades yeah. from Google. Uh, but this thing, a little pricey, uh, but still, I mean, it's it's been perfect. It's been absolutely fantastic. Everything I want in a, in a tablet for going on vacation with. So what are the common things you do with your tablet that make this a great tablet? Oh yeah, I mean, I I'm not I'm not a gamer, but it's a gaming tablet, which means the battery life is incredibly great. Uh, and so I get on like 14 hour flights when I'm going to conferences on the other side of the world. And so I need it to last that long. So content for, uh, you know, watching movies, et cetera. Uh, I read a lot of books. So storage space, it has a removable flash drive, making it really easy to transfer stuff from my desktop. Uh, you know, those are really my core ones. I mean, every once in a while, I need a game to actually entertain me on a 14 plus hour flight, uh, which I, I don't recommend to anyone uh, unless there's something really good in it for you. So that, that's really my, my core requirement there, uh, which is why I've gone for this instead of something with like e-ink or some or on, on that approach. Right on. Cool. All right. Marcus, what would you bring for a pick? Um, I, I thought of, of bringing another podcast, like a, a little bit of competition to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I don't think I play. When I, when, I, when I do a little bit of sports and, and it's one way of, of actually getting some information, in, but it's, um, uh, it's Farnham Street from Shane Parrish and he interviews just like top business leaders, um, top sports and coaches and other thing. And I've gone through well over 100 
series of, I think he's had uh, 190 podcasts by now, uh, does it every week or every second week. Um, I think every second week. And um, I'm, I'm following along almost everything. And I think it's, it's just inspirational what, you know, talking about engineering excellence, it is what are other disciplines doing, right? Sometimes it's someone in psychology, um, some other science fields, investing, um, sports, everything. And like, just gives you a different perspective. Um, learning from the best, what they have already figured out is what, what his tagline is. And I think I really, really like that. And I, I can only recommend, if you're short on time, um, I don't know how much I should go into recommending, <laughs> recommending other people here, but it's uh, Clear Thinking is the book uh, Shane Parrish brought out half a year ago. Um, it's summarizing well the whole community, what he has built up over the years and, and the consistency. Definitely worth a, worth a read. Right on. Very cool. Cool. So my pick for the week is um, there's a, a song that's actually an, an older song now from a band called Metallica. The song is called One. And it feels so weird to say that that's an old song now because that just reminds me that I am old now. But there's, you know, there's a lot of people who haven't heard it. And so there's a, a YouTube reaction video from a YouTuber called The Vocalist. She's like a classically trained vocal instructor. And so she watches the music video for Metallica's song one and reacts to it. And it's cool because there's just a lot of layers into this. The song one itself is about a movie from 1973 called Johnny got his gun about a soldier who's injured in world war one. And um, so the song is about that. And then, so there's uh, clips from the movie in the music video but then the orchestration of the song itself is just really well done. And then her reaction to that as she watches it and she's trying to comprehend the movie that the song is about, plus the orchestration and the instrumental work of the song. Like it's just all these layers in one short video that's super cool. Definitely worth checking out whether you are a Metallica fan or not. It's um, it's just there's entertainment there for people of all types. So that is YouTuber, the vocalist and her reaction of Metallica song one. And that's all we have for the podcast. So for everyone listening to the podcast, thank you for listening for all the people watching the live streams on Twitch, uh, YouTube or whatever other streaming platforms we're on. Thank you for watching and um marcus thanks for joining us this has been a cool conversation thanks a lot for having me it was an honor and um uh was was also a fun conversation definitely some challenging uh ideas and thoughts right on warren as always thanks for joining me and co-hosting the show yeah, and of course. Um, we'll see everyone next week <laughs>